Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Anda, for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I, don't, I know it's early. Oh, thanks. I was going to say it's mostly a slideshow of photos. So if, if you turn it down, but uh, hopefully it won't put you to sleep. Um, so today I'd like to speak about 20 minutes or so on uh, MSF or Médecins Sans Frontières. Um, and perhaps a little bit about what our role is now in the global surgery arena. Um, just to say that I am on the board of MSF Southern Africa. Um, it's a volunteer position. So what we're going to talk about today is just to do a bit of an introduction of what MSF is, who we are, um, move on to MSF surgery, and then talk about the role of MSF in global surgery. So MSF is an international medical humanitarian organization, which was founded uh, 46 years ago by doctors and journalists. And we really organize ourselves on three principles, to be independent, to be impartial, and to be neutral. Uh, our mission statement is to provide assistance to populations in distress, to victims of natural or man-made disasters, and to victims of armed conflict. Um, we work in 60 countries worldwide, um, and we have an operating budget of 1.2 billion euros annually. Um, most of that is concentrated in the Middle East, in Asia, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which is mostly where I've worked. Um, the top countries of where the money is spent is on that upper right-hand corner. I don't know if that projects, but essentially it's mostly Sub-Saharan Africa. The number one country is a the DRC. Organizationally, MSF is made up of 37 different sections and loosely organized by an international office. I like to say it's sort of like the EU, sort of like a, or the US, a federation of states. Um, it probably works about as well as the EU in that way. Um, so in the middle, we have the international office, and then we have five operational centers, or what we call operational departments. Um, those are all located, as you'll notice, in Western Europe, so Brussels, Paris, Amsterdam, Geneva, and Barcelona. And each of those operational centers or departments have other country or regional sections associated with those. So for example, the UK is associated with the Amsterdam Operational Center. This is actually quite important in, organizationally because that whole operational department will function independently from other ones. So much to the fact that, for example, in the DRC, all five operational centers are working there on different projects at the same time. Um, so organizationally, uh, let's say you volunteer with MSF, and I can explain a little bit about how that works later. Um, well, the operational centers will each have a country coordination team. So for example, in Burundi, um, where Amsterdam is operating there, then they will have certain specific field projects, so for example, uh, a HIV project, and then an, a field coordinator will run a field team there, and then you'll see the rest of the different types of people that might work there, including doctors and surgeons. Um, where is all that money coming from and going? So again, I mentioned uh, annual operating budget of about 1.2 billion euros, and most of that comes from private donors, so 92% from private donors. And most of those are individual donors, so people like you and I. Um, we do not take money from governments. We have not taken money from the US government for at least 20 years. We did take money from the EU until last year. Um, we, I'll, I'll explain later, but we work a lot with refugees and migrants, and there was a big issue with the EU-Turkey deal um, which had a big impact on the number of stranded migrants and now resulting um, people living in refugee camps. And so MSF has decided to distance itself from the EU as well. Um, how the funds are used, so almost 90% of the money goes directly into programs and very little into admin, as you can see. Um, where do we intervene? What types of interventions do we make? So the number one is to work in conflict areas, so war, natural disasters, um, we've been quite active in earthquakes um, recently, but hurricanes, 
as well. Um, again, I mentioned refugees and displaced persons. Um, with epidemics, I'll talk a bit about Ebola later. Psychological trauma, um, neglected diseases, which include HIV. Exclusion of care, so that would be persons, for example, living in prisons against detainees, people who don't otherwise have health care rights. Um, so this is sort of similar, but we work in trauma, sexual violence, maternal child health, cholera, Ebola, HIV, TB, Chagas, sleeping sickness, and malnutrition. So that's just a photo of a small baby with malnutrition being fed. So in southern Africa, where I live now, HIV and um, AIDS work is, is a big part of what we do. So up to 20 to 30 percent of the adult population in, in certain countries are HIV infected and living with AIDS. Um, MSF was quite uh, a big player in South Africa to bringing antiretrovirals to <coughs> South Africa. and They were one of the first providers of that in the 1990s. Now uh, the government has really taken over that in, in South Africa, that provision. But in the rural areas, adherence to ARVs is still quite difficult. And really the new model is to try to bring the medication and the care to the patients because the clinics are often still very far away. So here's a photo of an MSF counselor explaining to um, a patient who is on antiretrovirals the importance of staying on ARVs for her whole life. Um, MSF is also big on organizing sort of peer support groups where perhaps one HIV-infected patient would go to the clinic a month and collect the medication for all the other patients um, and then help distribute that um, and sort of figure out the signs and symptoms of who would then need to go in on their own. But this has really improved adherence for us. Um, Working with migrants and refugees is also a big part of what we do. These are pictures of Somalians crossing over into northern Kenya. Uh, northern Kenya has probably one of the largest uh, groups of refugees, almost 200,000 living on the border still, can't go home, um, can't really be integrated into Kenyan society. So most of these camps have very poor health care, access to the government health care, um, and MSF there, works there to provide um, water, sanitation, and basic health care. Um, I briefly mentioned, hinted about the EU-Turkey deal. So uh, because of the civil war in Syria, there are many refugees trying to get into Europe for asylum. They come through Turkey. And a few years ago, there was sort of an unofficial route through the Western Balkans to get into countries like Germany, who were then accepting the Syrian refugees. Um, but in 2016, the EU, in order to discourage this, made a deal with Turkey to no longer allow that route. And so what happened is thousands and thousands of people are stranded in the Balkans because the Balkans can't actually absorb those people. So a lot of them are just living in detainee camps. And then um, most refugees then try to go across the Mediterranean. And so you probably heard in the news a lot of boats sinking and people being stranded. So MSF actually has a boat, and now they are doing search and rescue, and then trying to help the um, asylum seekers after that. Um, Ebola, so MSF has been working with Ebola since the 1990s, when there were large outbreaks in Sudan and DRC. Um, until 2014, there were about 1,000 deaths from Ebola. Um, and then when the epidemic started in 2014 in Guinea, which spread as you probably all know, to Sierra Leone and Liberia, there were about 11,000 persons that died from Ebola in two years. Um, MSF was very active during this outbreak, um, and that, uh, that epidemic is now over. Um, and we're very happy to say that we contributed to making a vaccine, which has now been trialed and published in The Lancet, um, that is now very effective against the Zaire strain of Ebola. Okay, so I think most of you are surgeons or would like to be surgeons, so let's switch gears to talking about MSF and surgery. Um, we have surgical projects in about 30 countries worldwide. Um, we do about just over 80,000 procedures a year, and one-third of those are cesarean sections. MSF, again, mostly works in conflict and natural disaster settings, so most of the operations we perform are emergency surgery. Um, I will talk a little bit about what we do and we don't do, but one of the things that we don't really do is cancer surgery. 
So oncology surgery is really a whole another field that we are really not involved in. But otherwise, we do most types of other emergency surgery. So trauma, again, a big thing. These are photos from um, our project in Monrovia in Liberia about a decade ago when civil war broke out in the capital city. We actually were there for other reasons, but because we were already positioned there when the civil war broke out, we were actually then able to intervene and treat trauma victims. So a lot of um, disaster and conflict projects start or we are able to intervene because we are already there. So if there's a big earthquake in Haiti, it's very difficult to get there. But if you're already there, then it's at least you got one foot in the door. You still have to get the supplies in for the surgical for operations. Um, you have to bring in a lot of things. But if you are already there or you know the people in the government, that really helps a lot. Um, Gaza Strip, this is a child with burns being treated by an MSF surgeon in a tent hospital, actually. Haiti, um, in 2010, there was a very large earthquake that devastated the capital city of Port-au-Prince. Um, about a quarter of a million people displaced, many, many thousands killed, um, and really the infrastructure, including the two working hospitals in the city, were destroyed. MSF at the time actually had some trauma centers themselves, uh, a, a particular very large orthopedic hospital, um, and that was completely destroyed. Um, Pakistan um, earthquakes intervened there. In the Philippines, earthquake 2015. Um, again, we also work in conflict settings. And really here, we pride ourselves on being impartial and neutral, meaning that we tr would treat both sides of any conflict. So wounded combatants, um, innocent bystanders, we don't ask questions, uh, we treat. And then we also believe and feel that our hospital is a safe zone for fighting. And in general, throughout the world, our hospitals have been considered that sort of hands-off to the fighting. Um, in many cases in Congo, there was... When I, when I was there, there was fighting all around the hospital, but they knew that the hospital was supposed to be a safe zone. Um, as I'll talk about a little bit later, that isn't always respected. Um, here's another example of uh, one of our trauma hospitals. Um, this is Chad, about 15 years ago now. Uh, this was taken with uh, refugees walking across the border from Sudan, um, and then some of the rebels, the militia. Um, we also work in post-conflict settings. Um, we do some specialty um, reconstruction, and um, these are usually with pretty vulnerable populations. Um, the photo on the upper right is a picture of a child with nomo disease. I had never heard of this before I worked with MSF, but it is a necrotizing um, soft tissue infection of the face and mostly affects children between two and six, and they can be left quite disfigured. So we do have a plastic surgery project to treat that. Um, the young ladies at the bottom are from Malawi. Um, they are waiting for their vesicular, vaginal vesicular fistula repair. So obstetric fistulas are caused by obstructed labor. Usually happens in young women whose pelvises really can't handle the size of the baby um, and leaves them very devastated um, and, and incontinent. So I know that other NGOs also provide fistula care, but uh, MSF is also a provider. So surgery in disaster settings really requires a lot of creativity, and we are pretty resource limited. So a couple examples on the patient on the bottom uh, left had an, a laparotomy for trauma. Um, his chest drain is attached to a, just a bottle um, where it drains the blood. Um, at least I don't know what they do in the UK, but in the US we have fancy chest, chest drain sets. Um, that are attached to you know, wall suction. Um, for a PEEP bottle, so for the patient to try to expand his lungs, he's just using a regular um, one liter Schweppes bottle uh, with a straw attached to it to blow into. Um, I'm sure at the Radcliffe Hospital, your operating beds do not look like the one on the right, but that is one that I used um, in Sudan. So also sometimes um, you just have to be very creative. Our logisticians, so I'll mention later, but surgeons are really the least useful in um, humanitarian aid because we are the most differentiated. So we only really show up when everything else is in place. So the logisticians are the folks who source all our water, source how to build the hospital, figure out where your operating bed's going to come from, the materials. And so they built that for us as an operating table. Um, so, you know, I mentioned that we work in creative settings, it's resource limited, but we're really still don't think operating under a tree is really good enough and not good enough for our patients. So 
you know, what is the minimum standard for safe surgery in the humanitarian sector, in situations where you have to set up your own hospital, you know, what, what is acceptable? So at least in MSF, we came up with at least a standard of seven items or things that we feel like are quite important. And some of those to think the surgeons in the room might seem like things that you never have to worry about because when you walk into your theater, all these things are there. But for us as surgeons, we sometimes have to double check that these things are all still working. So first of all, the infrastructure, equipment and supply, water, clean water, um, electricity, the sterilization and hygiene, um, blood products, um, and then of course, a surgeon and anesthesiologist. And I also want to just qualify that last bit to say a surgical provider and an anesthetic provider, because it's not always fully trained surgeons and anesthetists. Okay, so infrastructure. Again, you know, when you walk into the Radcliffe Hospital, the surgeons expect that the building will be standing. So often for us, the buildings are no longer standing. So previously, um, a hospital earthquake. Um, another example in the earthquake, the photos on the upper right is what happened to our office in Port-au-Prince after the earthquake. And then um, on the bottom is our staff and lots of patients who just came to sleep at our residences because their homes were completely destroyed. So again, infrastructure, we take it for granted, but um, not always there. Uh, this is in Chad. Uh, there was no infrastructure we wanted to set up um, a hospital with operating theater, so we started from nothing. Um, in that particular case, um, field tents were very useful. So our um, logisticians sourced tents, they're usually ex-military tents, um, <coughs> and we were able to set this up as a sort of mash guard kind of frontline operating theater. This wasn't really connected to a bigger hospital, it was sort of a standalone. Um, the things that we encountered out there was very hot. It was at least 45 degrees, so very hot inside. But there was a lot of dust and sand blowing around. And so coming in from outside to get into the tent brought in all the dust and sand with it. So we actually figured out, or the logisticians figured out how to have a double flap. So a little passageway that you'd walk in, all that dust uh, will hopefully sort of settle, get brushed off, and then walk into the tent. But um, difficult for sterility in those settings. Um, field hospitals, this is something that's worked very well for MSF, especially in the last five years with different earthquakes. Um, getting supplies into regions, um, so after an earthquake, usually most of the infrastructure in the area then uh, also gets ruined. So in Pakistan, up in the north, where there's an earthquake, it's already in the mountainous areas. How do you get in supplies in order to set up a structure that you can build a hospital out of. So the field hospitals work well. This particular photo is on the airstrip in <coughs> Haiti um, after the 2010 earthquake, where MSF is setting up um, its field hospital um, out of tents. Um, so this material all comes in from our supply centers uh, in Europe. And so just examples of slowly setting up this field hospital. Um, and eventually completely set up. So what you do is you set up a number of these, about 20, and so you can have wards, you can have an operating theater, um, even had a high care unit, um, and then outpatients. Um, so again, I mentioned equipment and supply. People always say, oh, that's very cute and funny that you operate on that table, but what drugs are you going to use? So it's very difficult to do operations without anesthetics and uh, pain medication, antibiotics. So those are the drugs that we use because in an emergency, it is very difficult to source those locally. A, because you don't know what the quality is um, in such a short notice, and B, often their medication supply has been cut off as well. So we depend all on the shipment of, uh, of medications from our head offices in Europe. And so we actually have big supply centers that keep all this. Um, just out of interest, too, we have big sort of trauma kits that it's all prepackaged, and you open it up, and it's for treating 500, 1,000 war wounded, and it has everything up to a pen to mark the triage to say, you know, who's sick and who's not. So uh, luckily over the years, we sort of thought of everything. Um, sometimes our operating room tables are a bit better, a bit basic, but getting better, a little bit more. Advance. And this one is one of our flagship hospitals in Amman, Jordan. So because of the Iraqi uh, wars, um, there's been a lot of patients with bomb blasts and disfigurations, and so they do reconstructive work there. So this is probably one of the nicest um, hospitals that we have here. 
Um, water and sanitation. So again, water supply, usually in a place like Radcliffe Hospital, the water is piped in. You've got tap water that's clean that you wash your hands with, but water for us and clean water sometimes can be a real issue. Again, our logisticians trying to sort that out. Um, you know, something as simple as where did the surgeons wash their hands? And so trying to get clean water into the system where it can run into a tap that they can wash their hands. Um, the minimum is 100 liters per patient per operation. So if you can figure out how much volume you're doing, you need to work back and see um, how much water you need. Um, and this, of course, is not just for the patient themselves and the surgeon's hand washing, but to sterilize the equipment. Um, electricity, again, something that we all take for granted in the Western world, but for, um, for most operations, we need lights, and ideally we need some kind of electrocautery system. Um, this isn't always electricity 24 hours, seven days a week. Sometimes this is just um, a generator that will provide electricity um, during the times the theater is running. Um, similarly, for sterilization, in most Western countries, we use uh, electricity for sterilization. Um, MSF, in most places, in, at least in sub-Saharan Africa, we use uh, autoclaves that you can put under a gas cooker or on a wood-burning stove. And so there's anything from the 19 liters to very large um, liter capacity uh, autoclaves for sterilization. So blood products. Again, blood products also very difficult in an area where there isn't an established um, health system where blood products can be obtained from the government. Um, and so O negative staff are sometimes become donors in an emergency. I'm sure most people who've worked uh, overseas know that. Um, but it's difficult to work without that. And then finally, after everything's set up, um, a surgeon and an anesthesiologist are useful and necessary. Um, but again, a surgeon is really the last condition that's needed. So I feel, I feel like in the West, we surgeons feel like we're very important. And I do think that we are, but we're not as important, I think, sometimes as some of the other folks on the team. Um, I want to turn our attention a little bit to the project in Kunduz, Afghanistan. Um, and I'll explain in just a second why. Hold on one sec. Um, sorry, there's just have one thing to read to you. If I can find it. Yeah. So, um, Afghanistan uh, is a very large country and very isolated in terms of its infrastructure. Um, Kabul is the capital city, and that's sort of located in the middle of the country, a little bit on the northeast. But in the northeast section of Afghanistan, up where you see the little star, where it says Kunduz, is really isolated from the rest of the country. And that um, in, has, is a Taliban-occupied region. And obviously, there's a lot of fighting going on there. And the problem was that the severely injured patients really had nowhere to get care. They could go to Kabul, but it would take about two days to get there. Or they could go into neighboring Pakistan, which is east and south of them. Um, but again, not really a viable option. And so MSF uh, noticed that they really needed to provide care in that area. Um, and so in 2011, MSF took shipping containers and turned it into a functional hospital. Um, in 2012, because there were so many patients coming to this area, they extensively renovated this into a high-level trauma center, which cared for about 400 patients daily and did about 4,000 operations annually. It really became one of our flagship hospitals worldwide, it had a four-bed ICU and three operating theaters. This is just a bit of a schematic, but, and you won't be able to read that, but just to say we had an ICU there, there was a laboratory, there was an emergency room, um, there was an x-ray department, there was a mental health facility, a physio area, and then the operating theaters. And so um, this was a sort of hospital that everybody would come to tour, and um, it, I think it was a very useful hospital in that area. This graph just shows that it was, had a very high operating volume, up to 400 patients a month, um, and going up as the years went on between 2011 and then up to 2015. Um, this is just a picture of the hospital. And so in, two, in late 2015, the, the fighting that, with the Taliban really increased. And then the hospital found itself it stuck in the middle of the crossfire because the Taliban took over Kunduz, which is the city that it was in. And so hundreds of the hospital staff moved onto the grounds because they felt that it was a safe place. 
Um, and the team was overwhelmed with hundreds of wounded patients. And so suddenly, they found themselves working around the clock. And unfortunately, a week later, the US forces attacked our hospital. And there were two operating theaters uh, going on at that time. This was 2 in the morning. And those patients died. And in a total, 42 persons were killed and 37 persons were injured. Um, just an example of what the main corridor down the hospital looked like and what it looked like after the bombing. Um, this was the emergency room triage area, and this is what it looked like afterwards. Um, our operating room theater with our surgeons working, and this is what the theater looks like. You'll see that you can still see the theater lights in the window, but the operating room bed is completely destroyed. So after that, MSF spoke out. So MSF in general tries to remain neutral, impartial, but we really felt that this was bombing our hospital really did cross the line. And so we made a statement to say an urgent need for a widely agreed upon and unambiguous recognition of the practical rules under which hospitals operate in conflict zones. A functioning hospital caring for patients, such as the one in Kunduz, cannot simply lose its protection and be attacked. Wounded combatants must be treated without discrimination and cannot be attacked. And medical staff cannot be punished or attacked for providing treatment to wounded combatants. Um, this resulted a year later uh, in our president, which is Joanne Liu, uh, to go to the UN Security Council. Um, and she actually uh, made a quite a moving speech, and I'll just read a little bit of it because she says it much better than me. Um, in Afghanistan, the Central African Republic, Sudan, Syria, Ukraine, Yemen, hospitals are routinely bombed, raided, looted, or burned to the ground. We can no longer assume that fully functioning hospitals in which patients are fighting for their lives are out of bounds. Hospitals and patients have been dragged into the battlefield. We are facing an epidemic of attacks on health facilities, impeding our ability to do our core work. Medicine must not be a deadly occupation. Patients must not be attacked or slaughtered in their beds. This resolution must lead to all states and non-state actors stopping the carnage. Please end attacks on health care and populations in conflict areas. Seeking or providing health care must not be a death sentence. So I'm happy to say that uh, based on that uh, work that the UN Security Council on May 3rd last year unanimously adopted a resolution to um, condemn attacks against medical facilities, personnel, and patients in conflict situations, and to work um, to try to protect all those um, under an international framework. Okay, so on that positive note, um, let's just turn a little bit to global surgery and then what role do humanitarian aid agencies really play in that? So if you never heard of global surgery, or maybe you've heard too much about it, but I sum it all down to, it's just an academic term uh, now created to describe the provision of surgical care for everyone worldwide. So I just want to say that there have been people like Prof. Levy who have been working in global surgery for decades before that term even came up. Um, but now that academics, particularly in the UK, the US, are getting involved, they have to give it a name. So this is the name that they've given it. Um, and a lot of the now indicators and kind of objectives and goals, if you will, have been set up by um, this publication by The Lancet in 2015, where they got together a commission of about 100 academics to kind of do as much research as they could on what is the need and where are we trying to go in global surgery. So some of the things they came up with is a, a third of the global burden of disease is from surgical conditions. So I'll tr I translate that into surgery is useful in public health worldwide. Five billion persons cannot access safe and timely surgery, mostly in low to middle income countries. So again, a problem of surgical access, particularly in areas who don't have resources. 143 million procedures are needed annually at a minimum, and the poorest one third of the world's population receives very little of the worldwide procedures. So we'll translated it into, you know, most of the surgical procedures are performed in rich countries um, where there's access. And I think that global surgery can really be looked at in three different ways. It's service, providing the actual care. It's education, so <coughs> training and providing education for uh, the surgical and anesthetic workforce, and then research into the needs 
the unmet needs, and what we need to do moving forward. Okay, so how does MSF play into this? Well, the most obvious one is that MSF provides service. Um, but it only provides service in very specific areas, so conflict areas and a few post-conflict areas. And MSF, as I mentioned before, only provides 80,000 procedures annually, and there's a need of 143 million. So really, that's just a drop in the bucket. The other thing about agencies like MSF, they're not a development agency. So they actually hadn't been focused on in the past on training of local providers. And I think that's something important that the now global surgery is taking a step forward, is that it's all well and good to go in and provide 500 operations for people in Somalia, but if you don't train Somalian providers to do it themselves, then you know you will be going home at some point, and what are they left with? So I think that's an important new step in the whole world of global surgery. So again, service provision really isn't enough. Okay, so you know, then the question is, how can a group like MSF, we traditionally have not been research-based or focused on training, provide some research and education? So just a couple examples. And so in the area of research, uh, MSF in the past didn't ever really even report its outcomes or describe the quality of its care. Our motto was always like, we are too busy to write down or describe what we do. But then if you do that, nobody knows what you're doing. And more importantly, nobody can repeat it anywhere else because they didn't know what you were doing. So even about seven years ago, we just started trying to look at our surgical data. When I came on board to MSF, we had electronic databases of our operations, but nobody ever looked at them. It was only used to report back to the operational centers, okay, we do this many surgeries every year, but that was about it. So I, what I really wanted to do is just, just to look at our operative mortality, because actually we had no idea in these conflict areas how good of a job were we doing. You know, were, <coughs> was it a 30% mortality rate? Was it a low mortality? And how did we compare? So I just looked at about... 20,000 procedures, and this was in 13 countries. And just looking at that, our operative mortality was quite low, um, less than 1%. But as some of you who do research in this area know, that following patients after they leave the hospital in these set settings is very difficult, because we have no idea if they you know, go home on post-op day two and drop dead on post-op day three. All we know is that they're still alive when they leave. Um, because again, we work a lot in conflict areas. Um, this was just a article on rethinking surgical care in conflict. So again, the, the press, and even we thought that most of the care that we do in conflict areas is war wounded, amputations, x laps, removing bullets. Um, and so when we were planning on who to send to these areas, we always wanted our surgeons to have trauma experience, trauma experience. But actually looking at our data, we realized that even in those areas, a third of what we do are cesarean sections. And one of the issues is that when we recruited European, Canadian, Australian, American surgeons. Oh, they were pretty good at trauma, but they had no idea how to do a C-section. Um, and so we really had to retail our training once we looked at this. Um, Haiti in 2010, big earthquake. Really a bit of an organizational, I don't want to say nightmare, but there were about 500 aid agencies that tried to go to Haiti, all uncoordinated. And so what ended up happening was First of all, from the large agencies like ourselves and ICRC, I think we were too slow. It was, there was a lot of problems getting in. The airport was closed. People could only come in by boat. Um, and then the other problem is that nobody coordinated themselves. So um, I suppose it's like any place who needs just good management. So there were many agencies who would all go to one area of the country, and there was nobody working on the other side. Or you know, two different groups would bring in dialysis units but then they didn't need that many dialysis, they didn't have that many dialysis patients. And so there was no discussion and coordination between the groups. Um, and so we really noticed this and felt that for the next disaster, um, something like an emergency surgery coalition, so an organization between all the big aid agencies to really kind of work together and support a rapid deployment of services. So for example, the supply is always a big issue because it costs a lot of money for supply, and each agency can't really keep big supply centers all over the world. So the Middle East might be a hot spot. The Caribbean often has issues, but it's expensive to keep these kits just sitting there. And so we thought perhaps it would be better if the agencies could get together um, and kind of just have those supplies ready um, in case of an emergency very close to the disaster. Same thing with 
um, human resources. So surgeons are always in need in these disasters. But rather than every agency recruiting for themselves, maybe have one central one. Um, so yeah, that's something we, we are trying. It's not as easy, you think, to get adults to talk to each other, but um, we are trying. Um, in terms of training, I mentioned that MSF isn't really a training organization, but there have been several instances where we have trained local staff uh, out of necessity more than anything. So this was a write-up of um, in Haiti. So before the earthquake, this was in 1998 to 2006, there were areas in Haiti um, which were kept which were repeatedly struck by hurricanes. So MSF was often intervening there, but they could not get any of the Haitian anesthesiologists to come work in those areas. Um, it was a rural area, you know, most special specialists don't want to work in rural areas. And so what MSF did, they identified Haitian nurses um, in their hospitals and said, okay, we're going to teach you how to do the anesthetics. And so it was a two-year training program. Actually, it was quite, you know, well described. They had objectives. They had case logs of the number of cases that they did. They had supervisors. And at the end, they had a practical exam and a written exam. And so um, we did a write-up of their training program, but what we were interested in is to see how many were still working in Haiti afterwards, and could they find jobs in Haiti. So it looked like 10 years later, 80%, so it was 24 um, nurse anesthetists, were still working in Haiti, um, which we felt like that was pretty good. Um, interestingly, the other 20% had immigrated to the U.S. to work, so... Um, similarly, uh, we did a write-up of surgical care in Somalia. So Somalia in Mogadishu um, is an area that expatriates, meaning surgeons and anesthesiologists from other countries like Europe and the U.S. would come to work. But because of the fighting, they would often be evacuating. So they would come in for a few weeks, operate, and then have to go back out again, usually to Nairobi. And then the question was, who was doing the operating when those surgeons and anesthetists weren't there? And they actually trained the scrub nurse um, and physicians who are non-surgeons gave them the skills to do the operations. Um, and then, you know, we were still keeping a log of all those cases anyway, so we wanted to see, you know, was the mortality any worse, any better, and it was actually exactly the same um, when we weren't there. So again, you know, training local staff has a much longer lasting impact than just flying in and flying out. Um, also, you know, that local staff are often, quote unquote, stuck there because they may not have the papers to go elsewhere. And so it's, you know, in the end, in the long run, probably better for the community if you train them than to train an expat and ask them to go and live there. So, um, okay, so other ways that MSFs um, are getting involved in global surgery for education. So MSF is now starting a medical academy and sort of a training hospital, if you will, for both local and expatriate staff. So um, for local staff, for example, if they want to learn more about hospital management or they want to get a degree in public health, MSF is actually starting its own medical academy for its own staff to get training there. Um, and then more and more now continued on the ground training, like I mentioned, in Haiti um, and Somalia. So research, so there is now an operational research division um, which is now reporting outcomes and trying to improve the quality of care. That's not just in surgery, but in HIV care, Ebola, um, malnutrition. And that's very important because, again, in humanitarian aid, the focus is not always on how well you do it. It's just how fast you can do it and that you should just deliver the care. Um, and finally, now we're starting to collaborate with academic institutions and research. And that part I'm pretty excited about. Um, I think in, in Canada, um, uh, we're co collaborating in surgery with a couple of universities there, because um, this is also something very new for MSF. MSF has always been quite suspicious of uh, the academic world. All right, so in conclusion, MSF provides surgery in conflict and trauma settings. Um, surgery in disaster settings requires creativity and flexibility. Um, MSF provides service, but can contribute in research and education as well in this global health arena. Um, and I just want to take that MSF hat off and just say that I now work for the University of Cape Town. Um, we are very excited to say we are starting a center for global surgery, and we welcome any international collaboration, so I'm happy to discuss with anyone afterwards. Um, we do have a, one collaboration with the UK, I think uh, a few of you know, um, with the University of Birmingham to start up. Uh, we're participating in a randomized controlled trial, and they're helping us a bit with our funding for our unit. Um, we also collaborate with a couple universities in the U.S., but we're always looking for more collaborators. I feel that in South Africa, you know, we have a wealth of data, um, 
and a lot of interesting research questions, but we need smart folks like yourself who have more of the you know, research skills, um, trial skills, um, biostat skills, um, model, healthcare modeling skills to come in and collaborate. So we're always happy to chat. Thank you.